Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Morgan Ricks. Morgan is a law professor at Vanderbilt University, where he researches and writes on financial regulation. Between 2009 and 2010, he was a senior policy advisor and financial restructuring expert at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he focused primarily on financial stability issues and capital market policy in response to the financial crisis. Before joining the Treasury Department, he was a risk arbitrage trader at Citadel Investment Group, a hedge fund, and he previously served as the vice president in the investment banking division of Merrill Lynch & Company. Morgan is also the author of an interesting new book titled The Money Problem, Rethinking Financial Regulation. Today, he joins us to discuss his book and what it means for policy. Morgan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm glad to have you on there. I've read your book, and as you know, I wrote a review of it. It's a really fascinating book, and I encourage all the listeners to get a hold of a copy. Um, now, I want to begin because this, this book is really chock full of interesting ideas in finance and monetary economics, a great review of the literature, and that's some new things I didn't know I, I learned in reading your book as well. So how did you get into this book? What, what experience uh, was behind it, and uh, what, what motivated you to do it? Yeah, so I, uh, uh, well, so I, I, I got interested during the financial crisis in this set of issues. Uh, I think, like, like a lot of people, I watched with uh, a mix of horror and fascination in, in 2007 and 2008 as, as the financial system uh, really melted down. And I was, at the time, sitting on a trading desk at, at Citadel, a big Chicago hedge fund, um, and uh, and you know, as the crisis unfolded, folded, and particularly in the later stages, I I uh, decided to to make a move into public policy. And so, in in early um, in early 2009, I joined the Geithner Treasury on a small team there that was focused on uh, we were called the the Crisis Response Team originally. So it was run by a guy named Lee Sachs and a guy named Matt K. Baker, and they hired me as the first uh, team member. And uh, then we built out a team, and so we. We were focused there, you know, in 2009 on financial stabilization policy, and uh, and then we started to turn our attention to, uh, you know, in the later part of 2009, more to thinking about financial reform. There was a there was a separate team within Treasury that was spearheading uh, the 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 drafting efforts for Dodd Frank, but we started to get more involved with that, and that was when I started, I kind of started down the path that led to this book. Um, and, and, you know, I, I suppose it was, it was probably around 2010 that I, maybe the early part of 2010 that I, uh, 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 uh things started to, to click in the sense that I, I had, I had a, a thesis that I was really driving toward, but it, it took a number of years for me to, uh, for it to reach fruition into this book. You wrote some papers before the book that were the early seed of the book. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You know, in fact, I wrote, you know, even when I was at Treasury in, in kind of late 2009, early 2010, I wrote a, an internal memo that if, when I look back on it, it was kind of a really crude, uh, really, really crude precursor to some of the ideas of the book. And, and you know, we circulated it around Treasury and, and uh, Geithner took a look at it and told me it was wacky. <laughs> uh, and then we, we, we basically threw it in the trash. And I and so when I left Treasury, I kind of resurrected that set of ideas, and I think he was right. It was a, it was a wacky set of ideas then, but it needed a lot more development. And um, and so I wrote a few academic papers in 2010 and 2011, and then by, by 2012, I realized that the topic needed uh, for me to do it the right way needed to be in a, in a book form. Okay, so has Tim Geithner come back and read your book and changed his mind? Uh, you know, I haven't heard anything from him on it yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, I did send him an email when it was out, but I'm not, I'm not aware whether he's read it. We'll take his silence as an approval of the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, let, let's, let's begin with uh, a quick summary of your book. There's a lot to go through, but if you could summarize the arguments up front, um, and then we'll kind of work our way through them you know, piece by piece. Um, what is it that you see as the key problem, um, the key cause of the crisis, and what should be done about it? Yeah, so the book, you know, at its core is really a pretty old-fashioned idea. Um, so my argument, 
my core argument is that financial instability is mostly about private sector money creation. And I say this is old-fashioned because I think if you had said that to, say, Milton Friedman, he would have said it was self-evident. Uh, but, you know, most experts today, at least in the field of, of financial regulation, uh, don't tend to see it this way. And the actual path of financial regulatory reform has been mostly occupied with other things. Uh, so I, I'm arguing that we should consider doing things very differently. And one of the big conceptual hurdles and a major theme of the book is that, you know, the nature of money and what constitutes money has evolved very rapidly in recent decades. So it used to be when we thought about private private sector money creation and the, the textbook description of, of money creation, it's, it's deposits. Or before that, it was, it was, of course, circulating banknotes that banks issued. Uh, but now, you know, as Gary Gordon and others have described in detail, we have, we have what's, what's come to be known as a shadow banking system. Uh, and, and that term gets used in a lot of different ways. Uh, and and some, some, some of those ways, I think, are, less, are more useful than others. Uh, I use it to refer, in a pretty narrow sense, to a very specific business model that involves issuing a lot of short-term debt that's rolled over continuously. And so part of the argument of the book is that we have this, uh, this new, this, this really, um, this rapid growth in various forms of private money uh, in recent decades, and that in a very real sense, these instruments are monetary in the sense that they're deposit substitutes. The holders of these instruments use, think of them as, as cash and refer to them as cash or cash equivalents. And so in a very real sense, shadow banking creates money. And I document in the book that these markets are huge and they're pervasive. And I argue, among other things, that they're unstable and that this instability presents a uniquely grave threat to the broader economy. So, so like I said, that's all, in a, in a sense, that's all kind of old-fashioned, although actually each of those components is quite controversial. M much of the book is concerned with you know, what does it mean to say these instruments are monetary? That's a controversial topic. Is this funding model really unstable? And what does it mean to say it's unstable? That turns out to be controversial. And is this instability really uh, uh, dangerous uh, to the broader economy? That's also unstable. And, and so th the first part of the book is concerned with all those questions. Uh, and then the second and third parts of the book are, uh, okay, if I'm right about that, what do we do about it? And here I'm also pretty old-fashioned. So I really like our uh, U.S. system of insured depository institutions, insured banking that we've had since 1933, as, as amended a few times since then. Uh, and we can get into the details later if you want to, but the most, the most controversial part of the book is my argument that we really haven't given sufficient attention to entry restriction into money creation. So entry restriction is a, is a, has been around as a key part of banking law really since the emergence of fractional reserve banking. And, and in the U.S. and England, at least, we pretty much always restricted entry into the creation of monetary instruments understood as banknotes or, or later deposits. Uh, uh, my argument is that, well, the nature of, of money has changed and the, the nature of our entry restriction needs to change. So I'm advocating or suggesting at least that we think about imposing a generalized prohibition on uh, on private sector money creation outside the chartered banking system, which means prohibiting a very specific funding model. And I argue not only is this feasible, it's actually a lot more feasible than a lot of other things we're trying to do in financial regulation. In fact, if we did this, I argue we could stop trying to do a bunch of other things. So that's really, that's what the book's about. You could say it's a book about shadow banking or about short-term wholesale funding or about private money creation, uh, those to me are all ways of saying essentially the same thing. Okay, the first part of that message that you have in your book is about money. What is money? You give a chapter titled Taking Money Seriously, and that really resonated with me because like many people, I you know, too was um, under the impression or, or took the view that when we think of money, you know, it's M1, M2, 
And then the Great Recession comes along. Gary Gordon, as you mentioned, kind of opened my eyes that we got to take all forms of money seriously. Um, so the M2 measure would be more of retail money assets. And what you, you're pointing toward is these institutional money assets that are also very important. And uh, you mentioned in your, in your book that, you know, textbooks, principles of macro textbooks, money banking textbooks, um, you mentioned some of the better known ones. They still look at money kind of the old fashioned way. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, and, and it's understandable, right, certainly from a pedagogical perspective to describe deposit creation and, and to limit, uh, limit, limit your view to deposit specifically. But, you know, the problem is that we now have all these deposit substitutes um, that are really, as you put it, as you point out, institutional money. So I'm talking about things like uh, overnight repurchase agreements and asset-backed commercial paper, as well as euro dollars, as well as securities lending, uh, collateral obligations, uh, uh, variable rate demand notes and auction rate securities. I mean, there's a whole proliferation of these types of instruments uh, that are really serving from their holders' perspective as, as monetary assets, right? It's part of their cash reserve. They're not thinking of this as an investment security. They're thinking of it as a form of cash. And, and, uh, and so I, I think we haven't, certainly from a textbook perspective, you know, the textbooks haven't caught up to institutional reality here. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a conceptual hurdle to get over, which is, which is what do we mean when we say that these instruments have monetary attributes? Yeah, I'm still waiting for the first textbook to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, I, I started teaching my uh, undergrads, you know, soon after the crisis emerged, soon after I read Gorton's work. What is money? We got to think of it more broadly than, than normal. So that's why your book was really refreshing to see that um, that chapter is really clear. And in fact, I'm going to plan to use it in future classes that I teach where this money question comes up. Now you are clear to you know distinguish between what you call near money uh, near money assets or cash equivalents and kind of like the ultimate medium of exchange, which is actual currency or, or the dollar. Um, but you point out that these near money equivalents, they still satisfy money demand. So they're effectively functioning as a transaction asset, at least a, a potential one. Now, how do you define them in terms of uh, maturity? Because there, you, you make a point in the book, there are safe assets in general. So there's long-term treasuries, short-term treasuries. And you kind of draw a line in the sand um, right. in terms of what really is a near money asset. Yeah, so... Um so this, this, this idea of safe assets has become really prominent in the literature in recent years, and, and that term gets used in different ways, but I, th I think usually it's used as kind of a synonym for AAA, uh, AAA assets, AAA credit assets, which would include, say, a 10-year treasury bond. And, and, uh, uh, and so I, I argue that that is an excessively capacious understanding of what constitutes money and that moneyness really is something that arises at the short end of, of the yield curve. And the, the distinction is, is, you know, sort of obvious, right? If short-term debt, high-quality short-term debt, both has very little credit risk, but also very little interest rate risk. And so it fluctuates very little in value with, uh, in relation to the medium of exchange and therefore serves as, as, a, as an essential, essentially as a substitute for the medium of exchange. I choose a year cutoff. There's no magic to a year. Um, it is the traditional dividing line between the money market and the capital market. I, I think that term money market is not, um, isn't a misnomer. Uh, and I know some, some people, you know, some people have argued that it is a misnomer. We shouldn't refer to short-term debt as money. Uh, but, uh, it, that the one year maturity cutoff is pretty traditional within the financial markets. Um, it's also uh, uh, financial regulators and their new liquidity regulations have selected the one-year maturity cutoff as being significant. Um, so uh, I'm not alone in that. You know, others have chosen different cutoffs. So the accountants, for, for purposes of accounting, the maturity cut, the relevant maturity cutoff for something to be a cash equivalent is three months. So a, a longer-term uh, security would have to be classified as an investment security for accounting purposes, but if the if the maturity is three months or less, it's classifiable along with deposits on your on your balance sheet. Um, but why do I pick a year? Part yes, it's the traditional uh, financial market cutoff, but more importantly, you know, Jeremy Stein at Harvard, along with Sam Hansen and Robin Greenwood, um, uh, those are three three economists at Harvard. 
have done a lot of work on analyzing the treasury yield curve, and they document uh, that yields get really puzzlingly, puzzlingly low on treasuries at the short end of the curve, and their focus is on kind of six months and, 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 and less. Uh, but they show that there's this kind of moneyness premium. They refer to it as a moneyness premium or a convenience yield uh, in the sense that short-term treasury yields are a lot lower than one would predict based on an extrapolation of the longer-term yield curve. So, so creditors, uh, holders of these claims are paying extra for them in a sense. And, and they must be getting something out of that. And, and uh, Jeremy and his, and his colleagues, his co-authors, describe that as moneyness. And they, they document that phenomenon and show it kind of at the six-month and less maturity. Uh, I'm picking a year because it's traditional and because it's a bit outside of that six months. There's no magic to a year, but I think it's kind of about right. Well, that's where Treasury bills end, right, at a year? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I would – it's funny. When you look at – I mean, when you look more detail uh, in more detail at the way various – the way this issue gets treated in various domains – so securities lawyers use a nine-month maturity cutoff. Uh, if it's in within nine months, you're generally exempt from certain registration requirements under the securities laws. Keynes, if you go back and read the general theory, he suggests a maturity cutoff of three months. He says within three months, we can treat it as money. Outside of three months, we can treat it as a bond. Uh, so there's some range in here, you know, between zero and a year that's probably about right. You know, when I read your book and I read that chapter <clears throat> on taking money seriously, it was fascinating because I'd been working on uh, an M4 measure of the money supply. So the Center for Financial Stability, they have constructed some divisia measures of the money supply, yeah. and they're broader than the traditional simple sum M2 you'd get from the Federal Reserve. And the M4 measure includes some of these assets you've mentioned, and they, they also include treasury bills, but they stop at treasury bills. So th their definition was entirely consistent with yours. Hmm. And uh, I, I've done some work with uh, a co-author, Josh Henriksen, where we empirically look at, you know, what happens when there's a shock to M2 versus M3, M4, and al also M1, these different measures. And if you include the Great Recession period, um, the only one that produces reasonable results in terms of standard monetary theory, so things that, you know, pr responses in the price level, short-term effects on real output— M4 is the only one that gives the, the best measure. So I, I found it striking that you're making the case for this definition of, um, you know, where money gets cut off. And empirically, it seems to be supported by this uh, Divisia M4 measure. And I, I would encourage, you know, people to take a look at it. If you go to the Center for Financial Stability, as website, they actually have graphs. You can download the data. And what's fascinating is you see a clear break in the series during the crisis. So yeah. if, if you look at M2... You might think, oh, everything's fine, but M4 clearly has a collapse, and it's it's grown back past its peak, but it never fully has recovered um, back up to the trend growth path. There's kind of a permanent uh, reduction, kind of like GDP. There's been this permanent reduction in the growth path. Um, so it speaks, I think, a lot to the point you're making in your chapter, and I think that's why it resonates so much with uh, what I what I was thinking. Yeah, you know, I did I did come across the Divisia stuff in my research and, and ended up, uh, for some reason, not really pursuing it, but I'll have to take another look. Yeah, well, it's, it's just consistent with what you're, you're doing. All right, let's move on in your book to the part where you talk about money creation, and you get into how money is actually created. So why don't we talk about that and then, and then maybe segue into uh, what problem is there when the private sector makes it? You make an argument that there is a market failure in the money creation business. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, so this is, you know, in, 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 in some ways this will all be quite familiar. Um, um, so um, the, the funding model at issue here, whether it's deposits or whether it's these cash equivalents, is, is it always consists of rolling a lot of this stuff over continuously and using uh, these instruments to fund longer-term financial assets uh, using also a kind of fractional reserve of, of cash uh, to meet redemptions in the ordinary course. And so it's a law of large numbers business model. That's the, that's the standard text, textbook treatment. Um, I do think that there's a coordination game involved here. And I, I uh, so this is, you know, for those, I know a lot of your listeners are economists and are, are very familiar with modern banking theory. You know, for those who aren't, uh, there's a, a very famous 
contribution to the banking literature uh, by uh, Diamond and Dibvig from the early 1980s, where they argued that banking involves a coordination game with a good equilibrium and a bad equilibrium, and that, and that runs on banking institutions have a self-fulfilling dimension. Um, that, that's, you know, not everyone accepts that, uh, that runs do have a self-fulfilling dimension, but I, I, I think they do. Uh, I think that uh, the weight of the evidence points in that direction. And because there's a bad equilibrium and there's a self-fulfilling dimension, we can think of that, you know, we can think of that as, as being, uh, being a classic market failure. Okay. And you suggest that there's no market solution to this. Is that right? Well, I don't think there is. I mean, I'm open to the idea that there might be, but it doesn't seem to have, it doesn't seem to have materialized, at least not, not on, a, on a broad scale. I have to throw out there, what about the idea of a suspension clause? A suspension clause in the instrument. So a contractual agreement? Yeah, that says ahead of time, look, if, if, if this bank run does occur, we're going to suspend convertibility between you know, deposits and physical cash. Um, yeah, you know, I... I um, is that workable, I guess? I, you know, I'm aware there's a literature on that that I, uh, that I looked at some time ago, and that there may be some historical precedent for it in, uh, in Scotland and, and, uh, and England, uh, maybe in the United States, I don't really recall. Um, so, I, I, uh, look, I'm, I'm open to the idea that, that could work. I think, you know, one of the things that Gorton has argued, uh, and Hugh Rockoff, I think, has a version of this argument in relation to the Depression, is that... Uh, Suspension undermines the nature, the monetary nature of these instruments. So Gorton says when suspension of convertibility happens, now he's not referring to contractual suspension, he was re- referring to government imposed suspensions, but um, that when suspensions of convertibility have happened historically, you know, these claims on banks cease to be money in any meaningful sense. And, and Rockoff had a paper that I looked at some time ago that argued that the quality of the money stock declined in the Great Depression as a consequence of, uh, uh, of suspension. So you're likely to see these claims treat, cease to trade at par. Uh, they'll cease to serve a meaningful monetary function for their holders. And I'm not, it, it's not obvious to me that a suspension clause would deal effectively with uh, the knock-on consequences of run. So if an institution didn't want to suspend, it would still liquidate, seek to liquidate its asset portfolio in order to prevent redemptions, which it might want to do for reputational reasons. And, and if that happens on a broad scale, you end up, uh, you end up with disrupt- disruptions in the financial markets, I think, notwithstanding a, a suspension clause. But, you know, I, I'm, open to, I'm open to the argument that that could be workable. Yeah. Well, it is hard to think through what, what would it have meant for the uh, bank run of 2007, 2008. I'm not sure I, I know that answer. Um, how would they have had a suspension clause in place in the shadow banking system? Um, well, let's let's move on a bit to your discussion on banking. You have a chapter, Banking in Theory and Reality, and you go through, I guess, the standard models for why banking exists and, and as a consequence, why maybe money exists. And you, you, you mentioned two of them. You mentioned the commitment device model for banking as well as the information asymmetry model for banking. And you argue that they both have interesting things to say, but they're incomplete. They they don't really they don't really get at the heart of what is money. At least what, what the the role banks have in creating money. So can you speak mm-hmm. to that? Yeah. So I you know I'm uh, uh, um, so you know there's a number of theories about why why this funding model exists. Why why do certain institutions use demandable debt or very short term debt funding? And one of them is this. Uh, commitment device model that's associated with Charlie Calamiris and others, and it's really interesting. Um, in, in, in their model, um, uh, th- this funding model is used as a kind of um, way of solving an agency problem. It's, it's essentially a way of keeping the management team honest and preventing them from absconding with uh, the firm's assets. I find this interesting, but you know, it's really essentially a non-monetary model of banking in the sense that, uh, and 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 they're they're explicit about this in their paper. They say that liquidity demand is absent in their model, uh, and it can be maybe seen as a byproduct of this solution to this agency problem. So so uh, the monetary function of of banking kind of arrives as an 
incidentally uh, or as a byproduct here. And, and I, I, I don't, uh, as an intuitive matter, uh, I'm not sure how plausible that is. Yeah, that seems completely backwards. <laughs> you know, it, well, to me, it does. I mean, if you think of banks first and foremost as monetary institutions, it's weird to think of that as being a byproduct of a solution to an agency problem. Um, you know, the other question about those models that have ar- has arisen, I think, is you know, how do they connect up the right side and the left side of the balance sheet? So this funding model is really um, heavily associated with as- uh, financial asset portfolios and cr- credit portfolios in particular, and explaining why that particular asset profile uh, raises these agency problems for which short-term debt is, is, a, is a good solution. Isn't, that connection has never been obvious to me. Um, so while I find those models interesting, I, I don't, um, um, they don't, they, they don't, uh, uh, for me at least, get, um, um, get me very far. No, I, I agree with you on, on that commitment device model. I, I do want to point out an interesting, um, maybe an example where it seems to shed some light. But again, it, it doesn't get at this, this question of what is money and how do banks play a role in it. Mm-hmm. And that is the uh, tequila crisis in Mexico, 94, 95. I think Keller Marias has written about that where... Yeah, they. You know, my understanding, and I may be wrong, but my understanding was that the government of Mexico basically guaranteed all bank deposits, and then once the crisis hit, people realized they didn't have the resources to do that. Right. And so they said, "Oh goodness!" So they started. They actually started looking at balance sheets, the health of banks, and this kind of discipline story kicks in. And you, what you yeah. found is that banks that were sound. Um, deposits flowed to them out of banks that weren't sound, and, and so yeah. the good banks survived, the bad ones did not. But it's, yeah. but I think your bigger point is that it really doesn't answer this, this money question. Um, so let's, let's move to the next one, the information asymmetry model. I think probably a lot of our listeners have heard of this from, from Gary Gorton. So what are your thoughts on that? So I, I think, um, for me, this was a really powerful set of ideas, and, uh, and the, you know, the basic idea here is that... Uh, the, uh, the the financial markets produce certain kind of claims uh, for which uh, for, for which uh, research is not really rewarded that much. The point of them is to be insensitive to information, and uh, and, and this allows uh, investors. You know, I think in the original version of their model, uh, the idea is that was that there were informed traders and noise traders, and the noise traders will be taken advantage of. By the informed traders, and so the the noise traders would prefer to hold instruments uh, for which, uh, 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 with respect to which the production of information is not rewarded, and that way they could be not taken a- a- advantage of. Uh, I find this to be really powerful. I think it's a it's a um, it's a really interesting way of thinking about things like securitization, uh, the production of safe assets, which we referred to earlier. Uh, AAA bonds. Uh, uh, in other words, it's a way of understanding capital structure generally, at least for me. I, I find it helpful to think about that way. I'm not sure it gets, for me at least, it doesn't necessarily get to what's distinctive about banking because uh, information and sensitivity, I think, uh, can apply to long term debt as much as it can to short term debt. And yet, as we just talked about a moment ago, this moneyness property really seems to be a distinctive attribute of the short end of the curve. And I'm not sure that the information asymmetry models give us a good way of thinking about that. Um, and so I'm, uh, while, I, while I think they're powerful, they, uh, they, they don't fully illuminate the banking business model to me. Okay. So moving on from those, you, you also talk about in this chapter the, the right definition of what a panic is. Um, and you focus particularly on you know, this idea of, of a debt, short-term runnable debt panic. And you stress, you know, we, like an equity crisis in 1987 or maybe 2001 doesn't really measure up because it's focused on equity. Yeah. Um, so, so tell us more about this idea. So you, you see, as, and you mentioned this earlier, the primary threat that comes from, from the financial system is our bank runs. Is that right? That's what I think. Bank, bank runs... Under, understood to include shadow bank runs, right? So it's the unraveling of this of, of this type of funding model that we've been talking about that is what, in my view, we should be uh, far and away most concerned at, about when we do financial stability regulation and financial stability policy. 
So for me, a pan. So here I, I'll sound just like Gary Gordon, um, and, and, and you know Bernanke has made a similar point. Bernanke says he defines a panic in one of his speeches as uh, widespread redemptions by or widespread withdrawals of short-term funding to a set of financial institutions, and that's that's all I mean by a panic. It's a it's a run on the bank. It's not sales in the secondary market uh, per se. So an equity market disruption. Uh, is not in and of itself a panic. A panic uh, is widespread redemptions of of the financial sector short term debt. So that's 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 pretty much. Uh, uh, I think that's pretty standard and old fashioned. You know, I I, I the, uh, uh, Anna Schwartz has this paper that I haven't looked at in a while, but I think it was called Real and Pseudo Financial Crises, in which she equates runs on banks with real crises, and she says all this other stuff burst bubbles. And uh, corrections in the stock market and whatnot, she refers to as pseudo crises, and I, I, I agree with her definition, except that I'm not sure she would treat a shadow bank run, a shadow bank run as a, uh, or a shadow banking panic as a real crisis, whereas I would. So your explanation for the Great Recession, at least what triggered it, is a massive bank run on the shadow banking system, and and you, you discuss in your book some of the other, you know, ideas given for the Great Recession, um, everything from kind of the debt-fueled housing boom collapse to um, Austrian theory to you know, monitors discussion. But that's, y- your understanding of what happened is primarily a financial crisis driven by this bank run. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's what I think the main thing was. And that's not to say that there weren't multiple elements. And so... You know, one of the things that's really interested me since the crisis is the is the is the sheer diversity of explanations for what it was that happened uh, by by experts. And um, there, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of diversity. And uh, uh, so, uh, but I, I think you know, my view is not is not really unorthodox. It may in fact be the dominant view. I think uh, it's pretty clearly. The view of Ben Bernanke, as expressed in his in his recent book, which is that the financial crisis proper was a major source of damage uh, to a major source of the Great Recession. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to ask. Um, your uh, so your 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 claim is that it was a, a bank run that caused the crisis, and so the follow up question is: Well, why have we had so long of a slump or a slow recovery? Um, you know, Rockoff and Reinhardt would say, well, empirically, whenever you have a recession associated with bank runs or severe financial crisis, they just take time. They take time to um, unwind all the imbalances and, and to get uh, balance sheets back in order. But uh, do you do you have an explanation for why a banking crisis uh, that caused a recession would take so long um, to to uh, to recover? Yeah, I'm not sure I have a satisfactory one, and I and I and you know this is you know this is a topic on which I would defer to to uh, certainly defer to macroeconomists who have thought about this for a long time and studied it in detail. I you know I I, I you know a number a number of uh, of prominent economists argue that it's uh, that that this debt overhang has a big is a big part of the story. So uh, over levered household balance sheets. Uh, or over le- levered balance sheets in general throughout the economy create um, a a drag on that's uh, an impediment to recovery. Um, I think you know. I think there's. I don't see any reason why there wouldn't be some truth to it. Uh, you know, as I read through this, the literature here, I was I was sort of intrigued by the idea that maybe the economy just doesn't have any automatic tendency to refer to re- to revert back to. Uh, pre-crisis trend. So this kind of multiple equilibrium notion that um, you know is present in Keynes, and uh, and that others after him. Um, I fa- found James Tobin to be really interesting on this question uh, uh, of of whether the economy has natural adjustment mechanisms to return it back to the pre-crisis path. I- I'm not sure that's the right answer, but it, it seems to me to be. Uh, a plausible explanation for the lack of return to the, the pre-crisis trajectory. Yeah, it was interesting reading your book. You, you brought out the multiple equilibria story. We're, we're basically, we're just there's, there's multiple equilibria. We could be in a better one. We're stuck in the low growth rut equilibria. And you mentioned Keynes, Tobin. I, I'd also throw in there maybe a current version of that is uh, Roger 
Farmer from UCLA. He's a big advocate of that right now. Yeah, I, I, I read I read his book, which is an accessible version of of his theories, and I'm I'm kind of fascinated by it. I think I, I think I cite him in a footnote there in that section. But I, I just want to emphasize, I you know, for me that's more of a review of literature and theories. Uh, I I don't necessarily have uh, any strong attachment to it, and I don't I don't know that I am qualified to have a strong opinion on the question of failure to recover, why we fail to recover from, uh, uh, from, from sharp economic, you know, from, from, from sharp, uh, uh, acute macroeconomic disasters, uh, that are caused by the financial system. I'm not, I'm not really qualified to answer what I do think is important though. And what I do believe is that the financial crisis itself was a major driver of the recession. It was the spark. Right. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I don't know. I, I, you could call it. You know, w- what was the spark? You might say the spark was uh, a bubble in housing prices. Uh, uh, I mean, you you could you could take you 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 can take the the chain of causation back as far as you want to. Um, so I don't like to think of it as a spark. I think of the panic itself as kind of the dagger in the gut. Right. That's what really was the source of the damage. Another way of thinking about it is. Where would the economy have gone in the absence of the panic if, if everything else had played out the same way in terms of the conduct of monetary policy, in terms of uh, the path of asset prices, including housing prices and household balance sheets, et cetera? And so I suppose my argument is that in the absence of the shadow banking panic, uh, we would have had a much, uh, a much milder recession. You know, I don't know the answer to this question, but I wonder what happened in Australia uh, to its... Um shadow banking system, if they had it to a large extent, because they also had the big gro- uh, expansion of household debt, um, housing prices exploded, and they never had the Great Recession. They were Now, they were fortunate in that they had the ability to lower interest rates before hitting the zero lower bound. Yeah. They also support from fiscal policy. So it, it, it would be interesting to see what happened there. So I think that would be a good counterfactual. Um, I suspect they must not have had the same type of bank run that we did. Yeah, you know, I, I think, so I, I'm not as familiar with the Australia experience. Well, one thing that I find is interesting to look at or thought-provoking in, uh, in, uh, in the, the U.S. experience is to think about the timing of the macro contraction. I mean, the, you know, housing prices started to fall in late 2006. They started to fall really in earnest in the early part of 2007. And by the time, you know, by the time of the Lehman event, which is when the severe panic struck, that story of housing price correction was already about two-thirds played out. And, and, and we were still at that point in a very mild recession, right? I mean, the peak to trough contraction was about 20%. We were about 20% of the, of the, uh, of, of the way from peak to trough in terms of the macro contraction. And then there was this massive acceleration and the pace of contraction that happens immediately after uh, the acute phase of the financial crisis. And so to me, the timing of these events is suggestive of an independent role uh, for the panic uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of causing the contraction. No, yeah, I've, I agree with the uh, point you make about housing already being almost completely done, at least two-thirds of it you mentioned done, um, by the time things really turned sour in 2008. Um, housing had been contracting for a while. If you look at the housing sector data, employment, income, and all the sectors related to housing had been going down. And the rest of the economy actually had been faring uh, not so bad. I mean, it actually, you see some employment growth um, even through early 2008 outside of the housing-related sector. So we were weathering that recession well enough. I mean, it, it had, so the, I guess your point is, had this bank run not occurred, this may have just been an ordinary garden variety recession, not the Great Recession. Um, and I, of course, I, you know my views. I have a, a slightly different view at that point. I think the Fed may have made things worse, but I won't go yeah. there. Um, I, I will mention this, though, in terms of going back to your your. You know your observation about the slow recovery. You know the multiple equilibria story of Keynes, Tobin, Roger Farmer. It, it, it's a story of a coordination failure, right? That mm-hmm. um, for whatever reasons there's there's this increased liquidity demand. People are highly risk averse. No one wants to be the first one to put their you know, foot forward and maybe invest in a new plant, create jobs. Um, and so you know the question comes: Well, 
what is something that can coordinate all of these actors and and catalyze them to get going? And, and in my mind, that's where macroeconomic policy comes in. Something you know maybe yeah. temporarily raising the inflation rate so people don't want to hold on to these liquid assets as much. Some kind of spark. That, that's going to take the efforts of a coordinated macro policy response, which I think we did not have or have enough of um, after 2009. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with that. I, although, although again, I, I, I can't imagine that people really care what I think about. Uh, about, about hey, as you said, there's a diversity of policy, views. But, and... but I, I, I do think it, it, irrespective of how we answer that question, um, there's reason enough to think that we'd all be better off if we could avoid, avoid these kind of severe shocks to begin with. Oh, absolutely. And so, that, and, and absolutely. so that's, that's really what, that, that's really my key point in that chapter. No, and, and I think, you know, I, where we definitely agree is on the, this, this observation that you can't have a huge collapse in the money supply as measured by M4 and expect nothing to happen. I mean, when you have a huge drop like that in the money supply, something is going to happen. So I, I think, you know, that that's, a reality that we all have to deal with. Let's look at p- potential solutions now, and let's talk about a few others before we get to yours. Um, and let's let's talk about uh, one of the ones that has seemed to become more popular, and that's narrow banking. Yeah. Um, so, what is narrow banking, and and what are the challenges you see with it? Well, so people use that that term in slightly different ways, but what I when I talk about narrow banking, I I, I I'm referring to uh, taking your chartered banking institutions and requiring them to hold extremely safe assets. So in the, in the original and purest version of narrow banking, which is 100% reserve banking, uh, which was, of course was uh, advocated by Irving Fisher and Henry Simons and, and later by Milton Friedman, um, the idea is that a bank, a bank could hold nothing but base money. And so a bank essentially becomes just a pass-through vehicle. Money create, private sector money creation then just goes away. And, uh, and, and money creation is a public monopoly. And then so, of course, under the later versions of narrow banking, they liberalized it somewhat. So I think the idea, uh, as Bob Lighton and others described it in the, in the late 80s, uh, was to have, have banks be allowed to own treasuries, treasury bills at least. And so, so the, idea, the basic idea is let's do massive restrictions on portfolios to the very, very safest stuff. And, and, I, and so that, that set of ideas has been around for a long time, and it's always run up, I think, against two problems. And the first problem is one that I'm sure we'll talk about in a little while, which is this problem of regulatory arbitrage, or how do you prevent deposit substitutes from arising outside of your chartered banking system and essentially recreating the problem that you were trying to solve. And, and, and that's a problem that, um, you know, it's interesting. Henry Simons became... Uh, he was one of the guys who really spearheaded 100% reserve banking and, and, and was a leading thinker, an advocate of this in the 1930s. But he sort of ended up souring on it or becoming disillusioned because he didn't think he could solve this, um, this regulatory arbitrage problem. Other, Irving Fisher thought you could solve it. Milton Friedman thought there was a solution by paying interest on reserves to, to the 100% reserve banks. But essentially, uh, this has always been a problem that, that proponents have had to confront. I actually think this problem is... Uh, is solvable in the sense, I mean, I'm, I'm advocating entry restriction into creating monetary instruments, so I clearly think it's possible to do it as a regulatory matter. But, I, but what I think is the big problem with narrow banking is, its second, uh, is the second problem, which is what I've called fiscal monetary entanglement. So if, you, if, if you're going to have, if you're going to restrict uh, uh, the banking system to say treasury bills, and you need to make sure you have enough treasury bills to accommodate the desired money supply. Uh, assuming uh, we're assuming for this purpose that there, are, we, we've solved the regulatory arbitrage problem, we don't have private sector money creation happening outside the banking system. Well, then you know at that point the banking system and the Federal Reserve are your only money creators, and if you're restricting them to holdings of treasuries, then you've got to make sure you have enough treasuries outstanding to accommodate uh, the the economies need for transaction balances. So to put it another way, a narrow banking system would not be consistent with a long-term balanced budget, balanced fiscal budget, because there wouldn't be any treasuries outstanding, and so you couldn't have, uh, uh, you, you couldn't have a functioning banking system in the absence of those treasuries. So it requires a certain structure of government debt. Uh, I happen to think there are good reasons uh, to dis- divorce 
these two things and to have a monetary system that's compatible with a variety of fiscal environments, including a, a balanced budget. As far-fetched as a balanced budget may seem today, you know, it wasn't that long ago, you know, in 2000, the Fed was very concerned about the rapid pay down of the government debt. They were concerned that they were going to run out of enough government debt even to accommodate the base money supply, right? Just the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, and they, they were giving serious consideration to what other assets they would have to buy if there weren't uh, enough treasuries outstanding. So uh, to me, there, there, are, there, are, there are good reasons to want to divorce, uh, have a separation between fiscal and monetary, and you can't do that under narrow bank. Yeah, that was fascinating. I hadn't you know, considered that, that, that point you've made, that if you go to 100% reserve backing, you're going to be entangling fiscal and monetary policy. And I guess what's interesting is a lot of people who advocate that are more free market leaning types. And I wonder if they think through the implications of that. Well, you know, they ha- I mean, it's interesting. They all do in one way or another. Uh, well, you know, actually, Simons, I don't know if he did. I, but, but Irving Fisher has this great passage where he, where he basically says, what if, what if some fine day you bought all the treasury debt and it's outstanding, you, paid, you, know, you bought it all and you still need more, what are you going to do now? And his solution was, well, you just cut taxes. Uh, and, you know, in other words, create more debt to accommodate your, your money balances. Uh, and Milton Friedman has a, this passage that he, that he puts in a footnote of his program for monetary stability where he essentially goes through the same thing and he, and he, uh, he's, he, he says he's not really satisfied with any of the potential solutions. He said you could either have the central bank start buying things other than treasuries uh, or you can produce more debt to finance deficits. And he says neither of those answers is particularly appealing, but then he doesn't pursue the idea very much. Uh, and so, you know, other, you know, Bob Lighton addresses this point briefly toward the end of his book. So narrow banking proponents have, have, uh, have at least acknowledged the point, but I don't think they've ever addressed it satisfactorily. And, you know, this is, a, this is, it's not really just a hypothetical problem. And, you know, as I mentioned, we, we, we faced this issue in 2000, at least, hypo, you know, at least perceived it to be happening until, of course, we had the recession and, and, uh, and tax cuts that, that resulted in an upward trajectory of, of government debt again, and we stopped having to worry about it. Uh, but, but even in the late 19th century, I mean, one of the big flaws of the national banking system was that it required that national bank notes be collateralized by U.S. Treasury bonds. Well, there just weren't enough treasury bonds and, uh, uh, to, to satisfy money demand. And so the idea of creating a uniform national currency ran up against this problem of requiring a, that it be secured by treasury debt. Uh, so this is a recurring, you know, it's actually a recurring problem in monetary history. Yeah, I was going to mention that, that episode. It's fascinating. They actually changed the law, I believe, to uh, accommodate more money supply growth because yeah. there wasn't enough national debt. All right, let's move on to capital requirements. And probably our listeners are familiar with this one. This one's received a lot of coverage. Um, but you make an argument that they can actually, well, well you know, to some extent be good. They can also be counterproductive. Why? Well, I, I, you know, if, if, if it's actually for a similar reason than narrow banking. So let's, let's suppose we have a world where we, we have one set of money creation firms. We've solved, let's suppose we've solved this regulatory arbitrage problem. So there's no, there's no money creation outside of our chartered banking system. Uh, once you impose capital requirements on the system, uh, you're crowding out money creation by the system, right? For any, for any given asset portfolio of the banking system, uh, an increase in the amount of capital financing results in, you know, assume that the only types of financing available are, are capital or equity financing on the one hand and what I call money claim or monetary financing on the other hand. Uh, every dollar of capital financing or equity financing uh, results, holding assets constant results in a, in a reduction of your liabilities, of your monetary liabilities. And so you can't, if you, if, if you're, if you want the system to help you create money or to, uh, 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 to, to, to engage in money creation, you've got to have uh, capital requirements that are lenient enough to accommodate the desired money supply. So I'm not against capital requirements. I think you actually need them, but we can't, we can't make them arbitrarily high. Uh, the other, you know, the other thing about capital requirements, I mean, that there's two other brief points I'll make about capital requirements, which first is if you've decided that panics are the problem, which is what I argue in the book, capital requirements are a very indirect way of dealing with that problem. And they're a way that's hard to generalize and apply in generalized fashion across the financial system. So I think that's one of the difficulties of capital regulation 
Uh, another difficulty is that capital regulation in a world with derivatives is just irreducibly complex. Uh, I think this point doesn't get enough attention in the, in the literature on capital. There seems to be an assumption that we can make uh, capital regulation simple. You have a set of assets, you take a percentage of that, and you require that be equity capital. But, uh, of course, losses can arise from, uh, uh, from instruments that are not reflected as assets on the balance sheet, uh, particularly in a world with derivatives. And it's just extremely hard to calibrate capital regulation in a world with derivatives. So I, I'm not. This isn't. I'm not against capital regulation, but I think we rely on it uh, way too heavily to do too much heavy heavy lifting in modern financial stability regulation. Well, the third uh, proposal is kind of taking that idea of capital requirements to the limit. You have complete equity financed banking. Yeah. Um, so you talk about you call it floating price money. Um, why don't you mention that briefly, and then what challenges do you see with that? Yeah, I, I, so, you know, this, this kind of idea has been floated over the years a number of times. Why don't banks just look more like mutual funds and their, their cl the claims on banks would, would fluctuate in price? And, you know, I, I just, I, there seems to be demand in the economy for assets that have a stable value in nominal terms. And I, I, I think of that as money demand. Uh, and I don't think we can, uh, we can assume it away. So I'm not as, I'm not as, um, uh, I'm not that um, uh, um, uh, I'm not that attracted to the idea that we should just get rid of these fixed value claims. Yeah, I'm sympathetic to that view. I'm going to read from from your book here about John Cochran. You mentioned John Cochran. He has a proposal yeah. along these lines. He says, with today's technology, you could buy a cup of coffee by swiping a card or tapping a cell phone, selling two dollars and fifty cents of an S and P 500 fund, and crediting the coffee seller two dollars and fifty cents mortgage backed security fund. Accordingly, liquidity no longer requires people hold a large inventory of fixed value, pay in demand, and hence run prone securities. Of course, you know, the flip side of that is, and then David Andel Fado, who I had on the show before, we talked about this issue a little bit too. He has a great analogy. He says basically your ATM becomes a Las Vegas slot machine. You know, and who wants that? I mean, I, when I go to my ATM, I don't want to, you know, one day I have $1,000 in my account, next day I got $800 in the account. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. There is this, for whatever reason, we have this demand for fixed value, nominal, you know, short-term securities. Um, maybe it's a sticky price world we live in, but we want it, and historically, that's what's evolved. I mean, if you go back to the, you know, the free banking episodes, what kind of naturally emerged was this demand for, um, you know, fixed value, short-term debt, not equity-backed financing. Yeah, I mean, I, I essentially take for granted that there's, there's demand for that stuff, and we should be thinking, our monetary system, we, sh we should be thinking about how to accommodate that demand. All right, let's move to your solution now. And we have about 10 minutes left yep. in the show. Let's talk about your solution, how you are going to solve all the problems of the financial world. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know about all of them, but I, 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 do, I, I do think that this is a, a problem that we, can, uh, that, that we can make a lot of progress on. And, and so, you know, my, as, as I alluded to at the beginning, um, I kind of like the insured banking system that we've had for a long time. It's not perfect. We certainly haven't managed it perfectly, but the basic structure of it is that we're going to have this chartered set of financial institutions that are in the business of having monetary liabilities. Uh, we, we confine their, their asset portfolios to the safer end of the credit spectrum. We don't say it has to be treasuries, but we do say, you know, you can't, you can't hold stocks. You've got to have a diversified portfolio. You can't hold junk bonds and what have you. We require some equity financing as a loss absorption layer. And then we wrap the monetary liabilities with a federal guarantee uh, uh, for which we charge a fee. And uh, that basic structure to me has a really sound internal logic, uh, and I like it. But I, uh, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, the controversial part of, so I, I, I would build on the logic of the existing system, but the controversial part of this is building on the logic of entry restriction. So we currently say, as a matter of federal law, 12 U.S.C. Section 378A2, you're not allowed to have deposit liabilities unless you have a banking charter, right? So that's how, that's how entry restriction works. It's a generalized prohibition on everyone who's not a bank. So a banking charter confers an exemption from that prohibition. And so my suggestion in the book is that, uh, you know, money has changed. All this other stuff, what we've learned is that we need a much more functional definition of what constitutes a monetary instrument, right? Not just a deposit, uh, 
the, the term deposit is defined in the, in the law in circular fashion. Uh, a deposit is defined as a claim on a bank, and a bank is defined as a, an entity that has deposit liability. So it's perfectly circular. Um, we need a functional definition of what constitutes a monetary instrument, which in practice always means various kinds of very short-term debt issued by the financial sector. And so my suggestion in the book is that we should think much harder about restricting entry into this funding model. It, th this strategy, uh, when I say restricting entry, saying that only chartered banks are entitled to use large quantities of short-term debt rolled over continuously to, to finance a portfolio of financial assets. And so that would be a generalized prohibition. Uh, it presents a lot of questions, right? How do you enforce it? Uh, how do you specify what constitutes a monetary instrument in a way that uh, can't be easily gamed or arbitraged by the financial system? And I have, you know, I have a, a whole chapter essentially mostly devoted to that very question. Uh, uh, I think, you know, I, I actually wrote down in an appendix to one of the chapters uh, the the provision, the entry restriction provision. In other words, I wrote statutory text and said, this is how I would do it. Here are the problems it presents. And I think it's a lot more feasible than a lot of other things we're trying to do. But to me, that's the first step of financial regulation is entry restriction and the money creation. And in the absence of doing that, uh, we're, our, our financial regulatory problems are going to remain intractable. Well, you mentioned in, in the piece, in your, in your book, that the shadow banking system effectively already is backed by the government. It was during the crisis. You mentioned, you mentioned the large-scale interventions done by the government. Um, let me just quote um, page 99 in your book. You put the scale of these policy measures were staggering. At its peak, the Federal Reserve extended about $1 trillion of liquidity through an arsenal of emergency lending programs. The FDIC issued over $1 trillion in guarantees. The Treasury Department supplied $0.3 trillion in equity capital infusions and $3 trillion, rest, $3 trillion of rescues of the money market mutual fund. So there effectively is something in place. And I think what you're arguing is let's make it cleaner, official, more efficient. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, this is, uh, this is, uh, you know, to, to, to take a, to, to take a phrase from geopolitics, I'm, I am advocating a, a containment strategy for moral hazard. So I, I, we're, we're backing this stuff whether we want to or not. We kind of have to back it. Uh, the fact that we're backing it creates all sorts of bad incentive effects. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the too big to fail problem uh, is, is, and, and, uh, uh, is one manifestation of, uh, of, I think, this problem. And so I, I'd like to say, look, only a certain set of, of institutions are allowed to have this funny model, and they're required to live under a very carefully circumscribed institutional environment. Uh, and we are going to back their liabilities, their monetary liabilities. We're not going to pretend that we're not going to. Uh, this is an insurance type of a system where we're saying the money supply is, in fact, sovereign. Uh, uh, there's no constructive ambiguity at work. Uh, but, but, but I do think this is uh, a containment strategy in the sense that we would at least arguably be able to withdraw implicit support for much of the rest of the financial system. All right. Well, our guest today has been Morgan Ricks. Morgan, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.